For many people in Europe and North America, summer appeared to offer relief from COVID, the promise of normal life returning. That respite now appears to be ending. Infection rates are rising, intensive care beds are filling up, the vast majority of them with patients who haven't been vaccinated. Underlining the fact that the jab will protect most who get it from getting anything more than a mild case of the disease. Which is why Denmark, where more than 80% of those over 12 are fully vaccinated, has now lifted all COVID-19 restrictions. On the other side of the scale, the developing countries, where vaccines are still in drastically short supply. Today we're asking, Corona and the fourth wave, a pandemic for the unvaccinated? Welcome to To The Point. It's a pleasure to welcome our guests. Susanne Schreiber is with the German uh, Ethics uh, Commission, the Deutsche Ethikrat, and she says vaccination remains the best way to control the pandemic. It's a pleasure to welcome Eric Kirschbaum. He works as a freelance journalist for the LA Times and The Independent in Great Britain. It's incomprehensible, he says, why so many Americans and people in other places around the world are refusing to get protected with a proven vaccine. And my colleague Benjamin Alvarez Gruber is with us. He's been working for DW's COVID special desk. He's also a political correspondent in our Berlin bureau. And he's convinced vaccine inequality is unethical and unwise. It will lead to a prolonged pandemic for everyone. So I'd like to start with a look at where we are now as we head into fall here in the Northern Hemisphere. And Eric, are the rising numbers that we're seeing in many places in fact a harbinger of this dreaded fourth wave? And will it look like the other waves in terms of uh, overburdened healthcare systems, uh, ICU units uh, at their limits, and, um, and lockdowns? It's pretty discouraging at the moment. In the summer, it looked like with the vaccinations rolling out that we'd be in a much better position than we are now. But we see in the United States where only 52% of the people are vaccinated, that the, the cases are going way up again, the death rates are going way up again. It's really discouraging. The same thing is happening on a similar scale, smaller scale in Germany. Um, but there are some bright spots out there like Denmark, which you mentioned, where 80% of the people have been vaccinated and the coronavirus is more or less um, on the wane and nearly, nearly beaten. So the world is a, is a crazy, confusing place. <laughs> Susanna, are we nonetheless, even if vaccine rates aren't where many governments were hoping they'd be, are we nonetheless seeing a decoupling between the prevalence of the infection and overburdened healthcare systems? And I'm thinking particularly of Germany's case. Uh, Germany has just decided recently to stop relying largely on infection rates to measure the severity of the pandemic and to start focusing more on the actual degree of burden for healthcare systems. So what does that tell us? Are we seeing vaccines starting to break the cycle of escalation? Well, certainly vaccines are very helpful, but nevertheless, we still have a correlation. Yeah, so it, 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 before it used to be the case that um, we had a certain relation between the infection numbers and a certain percentage of people who ended up in ICUs, for example. Now this ratio between number of infected people and people in ICUs, that is going down, but the correlation is still there. So that means if the numbers are now rising, um, we can easily fill up all the ICUs with the same absolute numbers as we did before if we only have, if we only let the infection flow, so to speak. So yes, um, it was wise that Germany takes that into account, but we cannot get rid of infection numbers. We have to follow them and it's still a crisis and we still can end up in a situation that's as bad as it was last year. Benjamin, clearly all three of you, if I look at your opening statements, do believe that vaccines are crucial to bringing the pandemic under control. Yet in many places, the rate of vaccination absolutely isn't where governments were hoping that it would be. Give us a global overview, if you would. Is that more about skepticism on the part of citizens or is it about poor crisis management by governments themselves? I think it's a mix of both. If we look, for example, at Switzerland, where you're in the Western Europe countries, you have only 51 or 52 percent. 
of people who have been vaccinated and they have the problem of the hospital, of the capacity in the hospitals. So on one side, it is clearly when it comes to crisis management by the governments. And on the other side is also how the vaccine drive is developing. If these countries also get the vaccines. In Chile, for example, I'm from Chile, and the vaccine drive has been spectacular there. On one side, because there was no bureaucracy, people could just go with their IDs to get the jab, and they had a different approach to the one that Germany has right now. It was not get the people where the jabs are, but the other way around. So take the jabs and take them where people usually are. And that's something that Germany is doing now, but I think it's too late. Susanna, that is, yes, exactly. Germany is starting to do that now. Why didn't they move toward that far, far sooner? We're talking here about mobile vaccine units that go to sports events or other places and simply vaccinate any comer. Well, I don't know, but my personal interpretation is that in the beginning when we had the vaccines, there was this shortage and everyone wanted to have it. So the, so the, the question was how to really get a vaccination. And then suddenly within a month, it changed completely, right? And um, that's something that people didn't take into account. And while Germany is a bit slow, we are very security oriented before things change. So yes, we could have been a bit faster in implementing these low threshold methods to get the vaccines to the people. But of course, there are other cases where governments have been innovative and nonetheless vaccine levels are not where they should be. Just this past March, U.S. President Joe Biden held out the hope that by Independence Day on July 4th, the U.S. could celebrate its freedom from COVID. That hope has proven misplaced. The U.S. is once again seeing infections and death rates soar. Vaccination rates also dramatically vary across regions, not least because getting the jab has become a question of political identity. So US President Biden is planning drastic measures to increase the country's vaccination rate. They include mandatory vaccine for federal employees and strict requirements for businesses. This is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. And it's caused by the fact that despite America having unprecedented and successful vaccination program, we still have nearly 80 million Americans who have failed to get the shot. And to make matters worse, there are elected officials actively working to undermine the fight against COVID-19. The governor of Florida is one of those officials. He opposes the measures despite the rise in infections in the Republican-ruled South. People should not be cast aside because they make a medical decision for themselves. They should not lose their job. They should not be unable to put food on their table just because they made a different decision than the powers that be are demanding that they make. Get vaccinated. And the U.S. are not alone. Other countries are increasing the pressure on the unvaccinated. Will mandatory vaccination help fight the pandemic? And I want to pass that question straight on to Eric, uh, but with an addition, if I may. Uh, now, this vaccine mandate that Joe Biden has just ordered is due to affect up to 100 million Americans. That's a lot of people. So the question for me would be, amongst these 100 million, there are undoubtedly quite a few Republican vaccine skeptics. Will they comply, do you think? And what will be the longer term political fallout of this act? It's a really good question. We don't really know. I mean, unfortunately, in the United States, um, vaccinations has become a political issue. Some states with Republican governors, Republican votes are very low rates, well under 40. And the, and the infection rates are going way up there. The death rates are going way up. There was just a story last week um, of a 73-year-old heart, heart attack victim who couldn't get a hospital room because they were all filled with, with COVID. So it's, it's definitely a problem. Um, Biden is definitely raising the pressure. He's tried to do the soft approach until now, but he's bringing out the cannons now. He's leveraging the pressure and he's going pretty much as far as he can by forcing all federal workers to get vaccinated and any companies that rely on federal funds to get vaccinated. He's even reached into the private sector saying companies with more than 100 people have to either get vaccinated or get tested every week. So he's really ratcheting up the pressure. The nuclear option at the end of the day is to have a, a mandate, which the Supreme Court has already said the, the federal government has the power to do in a mandate. But let, let me drill deeper on the politics uh, yeah. of this. We've um, seen a lot of misinformation about vaccines out there mm -hmm. on especially social media and especially social media that lean rightward. Now, 
Some talk show hosts, radio talk show hosts, uh, some people in the right wing uh, media have actually, after getting infected themselves, come around and said, go out and get a vaccine. Has that made any difference in Republican ranks? Not a big difference. I mean, uh, we're still seeing, uh, I mean, the Republican governors stood up right away to tell Biden that's not going to work. So it's still a very political, toxic environment in the United States, which is unfortunate. A lot of people are going to die because of these political debates. But Biden is doing everything he can to try to raise the pressure. And for Biden, this is going to be the signature issue of his whole first term. Term, if he has a second term, the midterm elections will probably be fought on their corona question. It started looking very good for Biden when he started out with the vaccine going up. But if the United States keeps dropping the ball, the economy is starting to slow down already. Biden's going to have a big problem next year when the midterm elections come around. Susanna, let's shift our focus now to Germany, because here, too, we've seen lagging vaccination rates, as we mentioned. And we've seen many people, including many young people, holding out against vaccination. Why is that? It's not a political issue in the same way as the US, is it? It is a little bit a political issue, but not to the same extent. Um, I think we have a certain fraction of the population that really resist or reject vaccines or vaccinations. But I think we have a large proportion of those who simply don't care too much, right? Who don't see that they have to take part in it, who didn't have a chance to doing it because there are no low threshold offers. So I think we still have potential that we can recruit more people for the vaccinations. But we have not been very clever so far in how to achieve that. I want to talk in a moment about how uh, that potential could perhaps be maximized. But let me first ask you, Benjamin, to speak to us wearing both of your hats, your German hat and your Chilean hat. So starting with Germany, would you say more drastic measures are needed here? And would mandates of the type we're seeing in the U.S., would that be a feasible political tool for Germany? I think not feasible as a general mandate for vaccines. You can increase pressure for certain jobs, for example, people working in hospitals or people working with older people in care centers who need to get the jab, but there are other ways of increasing pressure. I mean, now in Germany, there's this debate about 2G and 3G. So basically, if you have a system with 3G, they would be get tested. So if you have a test, get impfed. If you have the vaccine or genesen, if you recovered from the disease, there would be one part. And the other one with 2G, leaving out the people who have a negative test. So that would also increase pressure on those who have not gotten the vaccine. And I think there is a percentage words, they wouldn't there. be able to go to what? Movie theaters, For concerts. example, for restaurants. I mean, the, that's the discussion right now. And as, as Susanne just pointed out, there is potential there. And it's not wise to think that those who are unvaccinated, all, all anti-vaxxers, there's a percentage there. There are surveys also by the Robert Koch Institute, so by Germany's Disease Control Agency. It says that some still need the option to get their jab. So none of them are anti-vaxxers. There are some of them, but there is still potential there. And there will be important to see how politicians will be able to increase not only the pressure, but also the information to them, to get the information and say, OK, maybe it is a good good decision to, to get the job myself. Now, let me get you to put your other hat on mm. and talk to us about Chile, because Chile, in fact, has quite an impressive vaccination rate now, 80 percent of the population, similar to Denmark. So two questions briefly. How did they do it? And secondly, and of course, it's not, it's not a brief answer, but nonetheless, uh, <laughs> if you would. And also, will we see Chile relax restrictions as Denmark is going to the point of actually allowing a resumption of normal life for those who are vaccinated? They are, and they will open also the borders starting in October for tourists who got their jab outside and other countries to be able uh, to make it into the country. I'd say what has been a very good point is the bureaucracy that you can just go and get the jab and that has helped them to go to a museum, to get it in a park, to get it in a church, what Germany is doing now and to see, OK, maybe the vaccine centers that are closing in Berlin because there are not many people going there anymore. We need to get the jabs there and, of course, to relax them as well. I mean, they've been pretty strict with several things when it comes to, for example, a night, night curfew in Chile that is still there. So they have been really, really strict uh, measures in Chile. And I always wonder, I usually cover this Querenka protest here in Germany as well, where they say this is a dictatorship and you protests. can do anything. Yeah. And this is a dictatorship to 
show them how the situation is in other countries where it's really strict, where you can really not leave the house, where like actual, actual lockdowns and not what we've seen here in Germany. Let me just now go back to Susanna with a question related to that, because we do see words like freedom uh, taking on enormous uh, um, attention here in Germany in the context of the COVID debate. And also, I think, historic references where we see anti-vaxxers saying they feel like Anna Frank uh, because their freedoms are being restricted. Does that example show us that a country's history is absolutely crucial to what kind of measures are going to work? I'm not sure that that's the right example with Anne Frank, but the history of a country certainly matters. Yeah, so I think the cultural history and the, 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 the attitudes that people have, like Germany has, for example, a high need for security, right? So people in Germany want to have their rules or are used to having their rules. They're used to being provided with a high degree of safety. And um, most of us don't know how well off we are if you compare us to other countries. So in the, and, and in other countries, it may be different. Perhaps one, one example with Portugal, where with the vaccinations, um, they only had the children's vaccinations against all kinds of infections um, several decades ago. So, so the people who still live in, in Portugal, they have seen how the death rates among children sub suddenly dropped and how beneficial vaccines can be. So I think this is also an historic reason why now there's a higher percentage of people who are, have a positive attitude. What um, I'm driving at, though, is perhaps another aspect. Um, during the Nazi era, Germany had a government that forced people to submit to certain medical procedures. Uh, that is often given as a reason why a vaccine mandate here would be very difficult for politicians to adopt. I don't know. I would bring up the counterexample that in East Germany, for example, people are very used to, you know, getting vaccinations. And I think it's was more in West Germany where people are a bit more hesitant. Nevertheless, we now observe that in particular in the East of Germany, um, we have more vaccine hesitants. So um, I'm not sure that this, this comparison really explains it all. Um, I'd rather say it's a little bit in our nature and whether that all can go back to the Third Reich. I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> Eric, clearly trust plays a very central role in the degree of acceptance uh, by the public of vaccination. Are there things that the U.S. authorities could and should have done better to really win public trust? Or is polarization such a black hole that it just mm -hmm. sucks up any such attempt? Yeah, I think political polarization colors everything in America. That's a cultural war in America. Every question seems to be Republican or Democrat, blue or red. There's no way around it. But in Germany, I think incentives could work. I think Germans need more incentives. I think Germany needs more role models. The United States could use more role models. Dolly Parton, people rolling up their sleeves, getting the jab. If soccer players in Germany, soccer stars or musicians like Helena Fischer would suddenly get vaccinated, I think that would do it a lot. I think they should even give incentives, free broad for us, or even 100 euros for everybody who gets vaccinated now. That will probably get the German rate up a lot higher, a lot faster than the mandate. Can I just ask you um, also, because you've been watching German politics for a long, long time, interestingly enough, we have federal elections around the corner here. We have all three of the main party's chancellor candidates saying uh, there will never be a lockdown again for those who are vaccinated. Is that realistic, do you think? And are you surprised that there's so much consensus among the mainstream politicians? Not really, because they're all in the same government now anyway, at least the two of the three candidates, they're all in the grand coalition. Um, I've been surprised that the corona issue has been sort of been uh, blocked out of the election campaign. It's sort of a loser subject nobody wants to touch right now. That's why there won't be um, fees for testing until after the election, things like that. The the cruel measures, the, the tougher steps will be coming after the election in October, which is a good thing. That'll help probably raise raise the levels as well. Susanna, you mentioned a moment ago children, and I, I'd like to ask you, should we be encouraging vaccination for kids? The pandemic has kept 1.5 billion young people out of school, and especially in poor countries, but also in rich ones. Yes, no, that's a definite yes from my side. We should encourage children um, to be vaccinated, in particular the ones in Germany now over 12, because that's um, where authorities said, um, yes, um, that's that's safe to do that. Also, the Ständige Impfkommission, so the committee responsible for vaccination recommendations said um, that children should get that. And yes, usually a counter argument is that um, children are less vulnerable, so, so they don't suffer um, as many, um, yeah, difficult cases, but on the other hand, we have 
a high number of, of children, nevertheless, who have this multi-organ um, inflammation, for example, which they can develop in response to COVID. And um, I'd like to just give two numbers and then I'll stop. That's if we had half a million children who were infected, um, that's about in May, and we had 350 of those who suffered then from this multi-organ disease. If we now do the comparison and we would vaccinate half a million children and 350 would have to go to intensive care units because of the vaccination, everyone would say, stop that. But if it's the, the virus, which you know can have long-term effects, which we don't know yet and so on, then people seem to care less. And I don't understand it personally because the mathematics of it are very clear. Yeah, so, so how yeah. to take the decision. Let us take a closer look at vaccine inequality, because while rich countries have stocks of vaccine large enough to start offering booster shots to those willing to get vaccinated, in many countries of the global south, vaccines remain in short supply. Our next report takes us to Kenya. Three members of this family have died of COVID-19. It happened very quickly, says James Mwangi, who lost his father, uncle and grandmother in a matter of days. We are traumatized because it's not so easy. Some people, you are with them two weeks ago, they had no issue. Then all of a sudden, in a span of less than 10 days, they're all gone. According to the World Health Organization, only 2% of the African population is vaccinated. The number of deaths is proportionately high. We cannot start administering booster shots when some of us don't even know if we will be able to get a second shot. It's just um, a really great injustice, and it's unfortunate that WHO's hands are also tied. The WHO assures there are enough doses to vaccinate at least health workers and the elderly. Yet so far, too few have been administered. How important is it to fight the pandemic globally? And Benjamin, your opening statement made it clear you think it's very, very important uh, to fight it globally. When last you were on the show in June, we observed that although politicians in Europe and North America love to pay lip service to that mantra that no one is safe till everyone is safe, they have not been honoring the principle in practice. Have you seen any change in the last few months? Not really. And one of the big problems we just heard in the report, the WHO, the World Health Organization, assured that they are enough doses, but they're not a charity and they don't have any political power. So the rich countries will, of course, vaccinate the people first, and then they will hand over jabs to poorer countries. And that's one of the big, big problems here. Eric, frankly, the U.S. is amongst the laggards in many ways. Its contribution to the international COVAX initiative that's supposed to guarantee global access to vaccines hasn't been much larger than Germany's. It's given 110 doses, 110 million doses. Germany's given 100 million and is considerably smaller and less rich than the U.S. Why doesn't President Biden walk his multilateralist talk? It's a good question. He's talked about 500 million doses, but the United States is right there in middle America and South America with new variants like the Mu coming up. So the United States is very vulnerable to coming back from around the world. Hopefully the United States will, will lead the way and get the world to donate more to other countries. Susanna, this week, the WHO issued a report on COVAX's achievements in its first year. It's exactly one year since it was uh, formed. And it, the report says this, and I quote, the global picture of access to COVID-19 vaccines is unacceptable. Only 20% of people in lower income countries have received a first dose compared to 80% in higher income countries. Is that ethically defensible? Is it, could you make an argument, as many politicians do, that they have a duty to protect their own populations first, regardless of what's happening in the rest of the world? Not really. It's really important to, to get the world vaccinated. Um, I can come up with a practical argument that it would be very difficult for, or would have been at least in Germany, very difficult for politicians as vaccines were still very scarce here then, then to take them and distribute them in the world. So they also have to think about their re-election and it may have given up uh, uproars in, in, in the population. Um, but ethically, no, we have to make sure that the world gets vaccinated. There's no way around it. 
And you mean experts are saying that COVAX won't really be able to ramp up its efforts in, until well into 2022. What does that mean for the global economy? Is health inequality also an economic risk, including for rich countries? Could we maybe make the argument on, on the basis of self-interest? It will, it will, if it's not on the basis of solidarity to help them as well. And that's why in my opening statement I said unwise, because it's not only when it comes to the pandemic that, I mean, if we have large parts of the world still operating as a variant factor, Factory, these variants will come back and then also hit the rich countries. And the same happens with the economy. If we have a lot of big economies who are not able to recover from this pandemic, then that will hit everyone. Eric, given where we are today, must we acknowledge that Corona isn't going away anytime soon and learn to live with an ongoing pandemic, at least amongst the unvaccinated? Yeah, definitely. If I were unvaccinated, I'd be a little bit nervous right now. But I like to look at countries like Denmark, where the glass is half full, where they're going to be living with corona, but in a smaller scale. It's not going to mess up everybody's lives anymore. But yeah, corona is going to be here for a long, long time, as it was with the Spanish flu 100 years ago. It didn't go right away either. It didn't go away, away right away either. And Susanna, just uh, a last brief quote from The Atlantic magazine. It said that the vaccination gap between wealthy democracies and the rest of the world is turbocharging inequality and could lead to a permanent permanent two-tier world where we have the safe in the rich world and the, and the unsafe in the poor world. Do you think that's really where we're heading? I'm more optimistic. I think it takes more time, more time than it should, but I think we will get the world vaccinated and definitely the vulnerable ones in the other countries. We're all working on that and certainly Western governments are too. Thank you. Thanks for those optimistic last words. Thanks to all of you for being with us here in the studio and thanks to you for tuning in. See you soon.